for anyone watching who doesn't know Kate, very briefly before we dive into more detail, Kate is a two times CrossFit Games competitor as well as a one time judge. Thank you to yesterday's, yesterday's <laughs> Instagram story. Uh, Kate has a wealth of experience working in the world of fitness, from being a member of CrossFit seminar staff to working for The Method Now and helping people with their nutrition. I first met Kate back in 2018 during my level two in Brisbane. And as soon as this podcast idea sort of came into light, I knew I'd like to ask her to feature on the podcast. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to join me today. Hell yeah. So I guess we start with sort of your coaching career. Um, it's funny and funny you actually posted that big, big story yesterday. It was quite, oh, quite a cool little insight anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so your first initial steps into the fitness industry. Uh, where were they what were they and your two to three biggest learns to this point now um I kind of got into fitness actually as I was rehabbing an ACL reconstruction back in university so I, I mean I always kind of like help, kept fit and, and enjoyed generally just exercise um, but I really got into training as I was recovering from the surgery and that was kind of when I started looking for things beyond just you know normal gym classes and that was how I found CrossFit um and then I got my level one probably six months into my CrossFit kind of journey, which is fairly early. Um, and then what happened was because I had my level one, it, it actually wasn't really about coaching. I just I just loved CrossFit. I just one of the guys in my gym was going to do his level one. He couldn't do it. He pulled out and he was like, hey, take my spot. And I was like, yes, hell yeah, of course I'll do that. So um it, it kind of just, it kind of randomly happened. And then because I had my level one, when I was back living in the US, it was an affiliate that had just opened up down the road for me. So I, I kind of just ended up knocking on the door and being like, hey, I have my level one. I'd previously worked on front desks at gyms. They weren't CrossFit gyms, but they were just like other normal gyms. Um, and so I just kind of jumped on and started working admin for them. And then eventually, as all gyms do, they needed someone to like fill in or coach yeah. and started shadowing and then started full-time training and managing the gym. So I was there for a couple of years um, and then ended up back in New Zealand once my visa expired, coaching there, and then ended up doing seminars in Australia. And it just made more sense to be in Australia. So I um, moved to Brisbane and I was in Brisbane for five years. And now I've been in Melbourne for two years, coming up two years, a year and a half. So it's amazing it was how fast it's gone then. Yeah, it does. And it just snowballed. Like it was never, you could never have planned it. You could have never planned it. <laughs> so throughout that time, obviously a lot changes with age anyway, but in terms of like coaching, what would you say your like two to three biggest chunks of, of learning were in that time period? Certainly my internship for getting on board with seminar staff, that was a really big wake up call. That was the first time I'd really had some really experienced trainers watching me and giving me very good feedback, um, which was really, really hard. That was yeah. a, that was a really full on experience. And, you know, for people who have done their level two, they kind of get a little bit of a taste of that because you have someone watching you and, and giving you very critical feedback, which is there to serve you, to make you better. So it's beneficial, but it's, it is really hard to take that stuff and deal with that and, and, and be okay with not being the amazing coach you thought you were. Or at least accepting that there are some things you might do really well, but there's always more things that you can work on that will make you even better. So um, that whole process of interning, and I did four seminars, so four weekends of, as an intern before I got off for the job, that whole process was one of the biggest learning curves for me as a coach. Um, just figuring out, you know, what they wanted, what they expected, how to handle the feedback, how to implement the feedback, how to do things according to the level one kernel. And yeah, it was a big wake up call for sure. And even I always say this, even if I hadn't gotten on staff, that internship would have been a big turning point for me as a coach because it, it very quickly made me kind of figure out a lot of things that I hadn't been doing that I thought I was a rock star at. <laughs> so those things, would you say they were more like soft skills or would it be more like specific details in coaching or was it sort of developing the understanding on how different people work in different ways and understanding personality? What what sort of was the biggest sort of wake up call at that point? It was certainly, for me at least, and I see this with a lot of trainers that we work with, it was bridging the gap between knowledge and application of that. So basically, like, you can understand what a good squat looks like and you understand how someone should clean and jerk or you understand how much intensity someone needs in a workout, but the actual 
coaching that delivers someone or delivers um, some kind of cue to someone that actually improves their squat mm -hmm. or helps them in a workout or gives them direct actionable feedback, that is the hardest thing to do. And you don't realize that you're not getting through to people until someone's watching you and they're like, hey, they're calling you on your bullshit. They're like, yeah, do that. Like, what do you, did you see improvement? And you're like, fuck, no, I didn't. Like, I didn't actually get across what I wanted to get across. And we're so good at being encouraging and we're so good at being supportive and we're so good at, you know, forging a community because we love each other and we want to support each other. But a coach's job is to coach. And, and so we can get really caught up in being like, yeah, good job. You're awesome. And just be that cheerleader. When in fact, we have to be like, hey, no, you need to do this and, and get kind of bossy and, and have really specific things that we want them to do in order to improve their movement. Um, so that was probably probably one of the main things for me, at least. And, you know, we see that a lot with people that come on in internal people, people in the gym. It's like they can have awesome personalities. They know all the information. They're awesome to hang out with. They're great at talking to people. But the actual coaching that they do can be non-existent. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, quite amazing to see that. And I think that's probably the biggest, especially for younger coaches getting into stuff, it's that's the biggest learning curve really is just even if you think you can articulate it mentally in your head, as soon as it comes out your mouth, it's like writing the intro for this. It sounds like it's going to go yeah. OK. And then as soon as yeah. it comes out, it sounds different. So um, in terms of coaching, then, who's been your, your biggest influence, whether that's like a mentor, family? I know we can't pick favorites, but who's been your one definite, uh, true <laughs> mentor? Um, I mean, I think Matt Swift has probably been one of my biggest mentors. Um, and I really respect him purely because of his constant and relentless pursuit of excellence. You know, he really is that person that represents the virtuoso in terms of being a trainer as well as an athlete for me. Um, and he set such a great example for, you know, all the Australian trainers. Um, and he's been there from way back in the beginning, but there have been people along the way that have always influenced me in a positive way. And, and some, some people that have just said certain things. So whether it's been clients that have given me feedback, that's helped me understand better methods of coaching them or coaching people in general, or whether it was, you know, the coach that I worked with at the gym who was like, Hey, you should be one of those level one trainers. Like there's been a lot of people that have influenced me a lot. And I think we're really lucky in our community that we are generally surrounded by people that are similar to us and people that are, you know, embracing becoming better versions of themselves and challenging themselves. So I mean, right now, um, probably one of my biggest influences is Rob Forte because I'm training with him and I'm training at his gym and I'm working for him. So it's certainly not like he's there and I'm I'm making notes and he's lecturing us. But you learn purely from observing the way that they behave and the way that they act and, and what they do. And, and it's um, really awesome to be around people who are just um, in, they have incredible integrity. And, you know, just like you said, it's the presence over the the over analysis almost it's just being in their company and that you know is almost more than any words really just watching them oh, do their thing it's actions right actions speak so much louder than words and and how someone carries himself in a difficult situation or deals with coronavirus or yeah. handles you know whatever it is a competition it's like you know there's so many things that you learn just by watching them go through things in terms of culture, then, I don't know if this has changed throughout your sort of coaching career, but what do you desire, what culture do you desire to create in people, whether that's behaviors, whether that's uh, sort of specific values, or is it just bringing out the best, best in them? Um, one thing that I really, there's sort of two parts to this. One is that effort is cool you know like trying is actually a cool thing to do and I think a lot of people really undermine their ability and capacity to either you know train hard or eat well or live a good healthy lifestyle so I think um just I, I wish that people could um and how do I kind of verbalize this I wish that people could know that effort is a good thing and just because they have to try harder at something doesn't mean that they're bad at it it just means that in order to get better they have to try and, and try will make them better it doesn't mean that they're never going to be better at something you know I think we identify as someone and that can mean that we generally become bound to the limits of that identity whereas if we try and we improve and we see progress we can actually become so much more um, than what we think we can become so I think trying 
and making effort is a really cool thing to do. And I wish more people would be okay with that. And, and if that means they reach out to a coach and they ask for help, or if that means they, you know, um, talk to someone that they've never met before in the gym, like, you know, whatever it is, like just trying to do things and doing things that are scary and challenging yourself. I think that's such an important thing to do. And then the flip side of that is that I, I really want people, and this is something that happens a lot with my nutrition coaching, but as well as CrossFit, I'm just like, hey, remember that this is about living your life and enjoying it and being happy. Like that's that's what we're here yeah. for. And it's like everyone has that Pat Sherwood quote up on their um, gym wall. It's like at the end of the day, we're here to work out and fucking high five each other. Like remember that that's what it's True. about. And I think that, you know, some, so many of us and myself included get caught up in like, I really want to do well at this and I really want to improve and I can't take time off. And if I do this one bad thing, it ruins it all. And it's like, hey, man, like just – work out, eat well, enjoy life, high five, like, and it's okay to have a treat every now and again, because, you know, it, it, you're only going to get this life one time, so don't take yourself too seriously, um, so yeah, two kind of opposite ends of the spectrum in a way, but both can combine really well, and you can, you know, enjoy all the aspects that life have to, has to offer. Yeah, I think I go in slightly off tangent, but I was listening to a podcast uh, with Tom Bilyeu, Impact Theory, and he was yeah. talking about like wisdom as being able to hold two contradicting thoughts in your head at the same time and not really be overly swayed by either one, but understand that in context, they both have, you know, valid. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Like hearing opinions and hearing other things and be able to consider it and, and decide if you want to take it on board or not. Like it's such a, it's a skill for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very tough skill. Um, next question. And this is something I've sort of been looking forward to asking. Um, it's a topic I know that's a huge inspiration for a lot of people. One of my clients follows you because of, uh, <laughs> they saw the the body image post that they really had enjoyed. Um, so what sort of relationship do you feel people need to adopt moving forward to just improve, uh, well, to improve their sort of mindset with regards to body image? And how can we help each other to, you know, amend the social notion of body image? That I know, is it's a pretty big question. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had the answer. Um, you know what? I think something, and this is something that I've been working through a lot mm -hmm. as well lately, like it's just been on my brain. Um, I think we, a lot of our body image issues come from this underlying concern and anxiety about what other people think of us, right? Like I think a lot of that comes from low self-esteem, low confidence. It's like, we're just worried about what people think. And we, and we're, it's not even that they're thinking stuff about us. It's what we think they're thinking about us. It's like this, you know, horrible mind fuck. But um, I just wish that people would realize, first of all, that everybody experiences those struggles. And I think that in itself can, it just help ease some of that anxiety and ease some of that like just worry and concern because it's like, you know, no matter who you are, how shredded you are, how perfect your body is, how like beautiful you are. It's like everybody has some kind of degree of struggle in accepting themselves in the way they are because we kind of have this bizarre beauty standard that's out there in the world but it's not normal it's not the normal and we, we kind of treat it as the norm or we treat it as maybe the expectation and it's like it's impossible to meet it because there is no normal Every, everybody is different everybody has their own unique beauty standard so I think the the first thing is to realize that everybody's worrying about it. Everybody is worried about their body and how they look and and how they look compared to someone else and, and which is better and, and what they want to improve. And then we're also very good at magnifying those flaws. So we're so critical of ourselves. And, you know, anyone looking in the mirror at themselves would see the um, the hip dips or the, the bulky chest or the pot belly or the cellulite on their thighs or the, the disproportionate limbs, whatever it may be. Yeah. But when other people look at you, they only see you in your entirety. And that's if they're just looking at you in a physical sense. And and how often do we look at someone purely for their physical, you know, their outside parts? Like we see people as their eyes when they talk and the sound of their voice and if they're excited or if they're tired that day and and if they're, you know, what their body language is like. Like that, that's how we interpret and how we understand each other. Like I I couldn't tell you, you know, what color shirt or shorts my friend was wearing that I was mm -hmm. hanging out for hours with today because I just like I don't even think about that stuff. And I think we get so worried about what people are thinking about that stuff with regards to us. 
it's like, hang on, there's a disconnect. Like, I don't know what that person has done or worried about or is has got going on in their mind with regards to their body. But yet I'm thinking about this, you know, 24 seven. And it's just like, just doing me doing my head in, but it's just, I'm like, Hey, what? <laughs> no one's thinking about it. No one is thinking about you. Um, so we kind of have to like, let it go almost and just mm-hmm. surrender and just be like, it's okay to not be perfect. And it's okay to not feel amazing. Because no one really gives a fuck. Like, no one cares. And that's a really nice realization to come to. Yes, it's easier said than done. Um, But I think there's a little bit of practice that goes with just recognizing what your thoughts are and and what you do look at in the mirror. And if you're looking at a photo, like, what is it that that you look at? Are you looking for the flaws or are you looking for the features? Because it's unfair to only look for one. You have to look mm-hmm. at both. But at least treat yourself yeah. fairly. Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Balance. Yeah. yeah, it's just about practice. And I think that's something that, um, in terms of self-talk, that was a for me as an athlete, like everybody experiences bad days in the gym, right? And the pressure to perform just heightens that. It just magnifies all those problems. And we, we get really good at finding evidence for why we shouldn't succeed. And that can be if you're competing or if you're on a diet and you want to lose weight or if you're trying to gain weight or if you're trying to build up your squat strength. Like we want to do really well and we are very good at looking for the reason that we can't and the reason that we're special and unique and that we're we're just never going to be like that person. We, we think that we're the exception, but we're the rule. Like generally speaking, we're always the rule. And so I think if people can look for evidence for why they can succeed or start to almost argue against the things that they're looking for that are proof of why they shouldn't succeed or why they can't do those things. Or like I just said, start, stop looking for why you're special and why you can't do it and why you're the exception and start recognizing that, no, you're no different to everybody else. Like you are just a head, a body, two arms and two legs, just like everybody else. And you can see that as like a, well, I'm not fucking special. This sucks. Or you can see it as, you're no different to Katrin David's daughter and Matt Fraser. You're no different to the person that has lost 20 kilos. You're no different to the Olympic lifter that went to the, you know, when where was the most recent Olympics? I want to say Rio, but yeah, I don't know. 2016, 2016 Rio. Yeah, this, it was meant to be Tokyo, but it's been it's been Tokyo yeah. this year. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, you're no different. And I think when people start to recognize that, you can – you can draw parallels between yourself and someone else's experience. And that can be really positive and uplifting. Um, And I think that's something that I do a lot. I try to do at least on my social media. I try to be transparent in the fact that, you know, I've done some things that people will, you know, would potentially only ever dream of. And I only ever thought I would dream of it. You know, it's like, I would never have expected some of the things that I've been able to accomplish to actually happen. But I try to be transparent in my struggles and in the issues and the ups and downs that I've had, because it's like, Hey man, like, I am so much like you. It's not even funny. Like I am not unique. I am not special. I was not born with a gift. I was not talented. Like I came into CrossFit a little bit overweight and like pretty lazy. I was a pretty big binge drinker. Like I just come out of university. Like I was doing a lot of travel. Like there was nothing special about me, but I've just done enough hours and spent enough time practicing it that I've, and I've been around the right kind of people and in the right situation. And it's just, things just kind of work if you keep on putting in the time it's kind of like that rule of ten thousand hours to become a master or something it's just it's about you know there's no gifted person it's someone that's acquired a skill over a certain amount of time and the difference between you and the top of that podium is probably the number of hours you've been training for like you you hit the nail on the head specifically like whether it's food whether it's you know business whether it's fitness just amending that perspective and not feeling like you're the one who got sort of the worst hand relative to someone else and I think we're easy easily led to justify stuff negatively it's almost this portrayal of trying to be humble all the time that sometimes stops us yeah. from looking at yeah. the positives um regarding your experience specifically is there anything you've done that has helped you with changing that sort of shift mentally or cultivate confidence in yourself Mm. One of the most tangible tools that I was given was by a sports psychologist that I was seeing in Brisbane. Um, And it can be applied to quite literally anything. I applied it to training, obviously, because that was what I was doing at the time. It was my focus. Um, But it was basically doing a reflection on the things that I was doing. And the process of it was you recognize the bad thoughts and you could kind of replace them with good thoughts. So it was literally I would have a table and it was 
Monday through to, um, you know, Saturday or Sunday. And, and it would have the different categories of training that I was doing. So it would have warm up, uh, lift, conditioning piece, accessories, cool down or whatever it was for each day. And then I would be able to enter in notes and I would mark off whether my effort was high, moderate or low. And what happened was I, I probably only did this for two weeks. Like I didn't do it for very long yeah. because as soon as you recognize it, it's like you you just see it and it's very clear and then you can turn it around because awareness is, you know, kind of the first step. And so you would put in the green, yellow, red light system. And the first week that I did it, I think I had all red except for maybe one or two yellows. Maybe I had a green in there somewhere, but it was like for five training sessions that I'd done, I didn't believe that I'd put in any effort. And what I had done is in my notes, I'd put in all the reasons that I did really badly. And what happened was, what I had done was either based my experience on how I was feeling, which now basically my mantra is how you feel is irrelevant, or I based my effort on my outcome. So the result of that session, whether I felt like I'd performed well or bad. So effort and performance or effort and outcome are two very different things. And your effort can be very, very high, but you can have a terrible, you could come last in a race, but if, you know that might've been your best performance or your best effort for of your lifetime. So separating those two out was really important. And what happened was all the reasons that I could find that were why I'd done poorly or why I'd not done as well or why my performance was bad and why my effort was low were actually reasons that my effort was high. So, for example, there was one session I did Diane and we'd done a whole lot of handstand push-ups or something rather beforehand. And I just kind of crunched my neck a little bit. And I was like, man, I, I just... I put my neck out. That was really bad. I went into Diane with a really bad mindset. I felt like shit, but I also PB Diane, but I turned it into this like yeah. really negative thing. It was like bizarre. I'm like, what the heck is what's happening? And so we kind of went back into it and we're like, hang on a minute. You've just given me evidence of why, in fact, you've done incredible because you put your neck out and, you know, imagine yourself in a competition situation where you've done something like you've, whether it's like, and I mean, I did this at the games, I sprained my ankle on the second event and mm -hmm. we were, we were sitting in second place. It was like, you couldn't get a worse time to throw out your freaking ankle bone. Um, so dealing with some kind of a issue, whether it's physical or mental, and then training in spite of that and doing the work in spite of that and putting in effort, that was the result. That was the thing that was the win for that session. It, even if I hadn't PB Diane, even if it had gone terribly, the fact that you still did it and the fact that, you know, later on as I got better at this, what would happen is, you know, I would have, I would get really upset in workouts or I'd get mad. I'd get pissed off. I get frustrated, whatever it was, you get sad. You want to fucking ball your eyes out. Lots of girls crying across that. I was that girl once upon a time. <laughs> and it was the, the effort for me initially was like, Oh, it was low effort. I did really bad. It was horrible. Like it, that was a red light. And then what happened was even if I had the same experience, even if the result was the same, even if I got the same time in the workout, even if whatever it was happened the same, if I could keep my cool, if I could just relax and breathe and be okay and smile or laugh about it and just laugh at myself for being so ridiculous and dramatic or whatever it was, yeah. that was an incredible effort because I knew that where my brain wanted to go was down that hole of like, you suck, this is shit, this is never going to happen for you. And you turn it around and you're like, hey, I feel like balls, but I'm still here and I'm still doing it. And I'm still putting in and that's all that matters and you do that enough and over time you continue to get better and you progress because you can kind of see the light a little bit um and i think that when people can do that with regards to like body image or looking in the mirror and start looking at like hey like for example when you weigh yourself like what what are the thoughts what is that feeling what is that where is that disappointment coming from and and can you sit on that emotion and and just pull it apart a little bit more because I think sometimes we feel something and we just accept it and it's like okay I feel like this and this is why and it's horrible but mm -hmm. it's like hey stand on the scales the weight's not gone down or it's gone up whatever it is and people are like oh I'm so I've been working so hard why isn't it working and it's like hang on a minute is it really not working or did the scales just do something strange for one day and yeah. also 
what do we know about the scales? Like the scales fluctuate a lot. What time did you eat dinner last night? Hey, did you do a massive leg workout yesterday? Like where are you on your menstrual cycle? Like what's going on? And we can start to one, uncover the reasons for a fluctuation. And two, when you start looking at like, hey, what, what were the automatic thoughts? And if you weren't to just let yourself automatically think those things what could you think instead like what if you if you had to coach yourself what would you say and so it's it's that process of like okay the scales went down what does that change about what I do today nothing I still show up okay there's a win all right you've turned it around you're, you're going to just do the work because you just have to trust that process so that day you don't change how you eat you just keep on going as if it didn't even happen as if nothing you know nothing went wrong mm -hmm. I think that that's kind of like the beginning of, of like hey, we all experience bad thoughts. We all have those horrible things that just our brain is like, oh, this is the worst. Why even bother? Like, I'm so uncomfortable. This is so not fun. I just want to do the easy thing. I just want to give up. But, you know, like our brains like to do the easy stuff. It's what's sufficient. So we have to know that like when it feels hard, we're actually doing the right thing and we just have to keep going. And mm -hmm. that whole just keep going, something is better than nothing has been in terms of like weight, and body image and eating something that's better than nothing has been a big turning point for me personally in terms of how you can keep moving forward even if it feels like nothing is working for you mm -hmm. it's that it's almost the athlete paradox isn't it of you never you're never good enough and there's always something that you can improve and you know to a degree that's yeah. extremely powerful like you do increase your effort in certain things it makes you show up tomorrow but there's a line where that becomes quite dangerous. And when people start tipping over that, it's making sure they don't, you know, fall off the other side almost. Yeah, I just listened to Kristen Halte on um, on the uh, Julie Fouché podcast. And mm. it's awesome because she's like, she came second, second at the games last year, right? And she's like, I got on the podium and like, man, it wasn't that amazing. And you're just like, how, <laughs> how is that not, what do you mean? But you can recognize that, right? Like when you accomplish a goal, it's anticlimactic. It really is because first of all, like the goal, when we put happiness on the other side of a goal, like it always disappoints because happiness doesn't exist on the other side of a goal. One, because we tend to move the goalposts. And two, because happiness isn't something that just like is sitting there waiting for us to like hit it and be like, okay, we're satisfied. Everything's yeah. great now. Happiness is something that we have to experience in the present moment, right? So something that I learned from Rob and it was like, it was this unreal, like, I swear if there was a light above my head, it went ping, because he was like, you have to, like, something, it was actually something about his journey. He was talking about his experience with training, and he was going through a rough patch, or things weren't, he just wasn't enjoying it. He was like, so I just started, I just reminded myself, or I just realized that I just, I just enjoy training. Like, I, I train because I enjoy training. Like, that's why I show up every day. I literally just like to do that thing. The com competitions, they're awesome. They're cheering on top. That's, it's amazing. And I still have those goals, but I became so much happier in that process when I just was showing up because I wanted to be there that day. I just wanted to do that training that day. That's all I did it for. And it was like, oh my God, we can train for the sake of training. Of course. I forgot and, about that. And that, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. that is like, yeah. that's when you enjoy it. And that's when you, and, and you know what, when you go right back to when we all started CrossFit and, and especially for people who are competitive now, when you think of why you wanted to compete, it wasn't because you wanted to be on the competition floor or you want to be on the podium. It was because you really liked CrossFit and you just wanted to get better. You just wanted to keep working towards something because you just wanted an excuse to do CrossFit. Like that was really why we did it for. And then, you get all caught up in like the pressure of like, I need to perform for this one thing and it's so important. It's more important than everything else. And it's like, no, strip it back, strip it right back. And just remember that we show up every day to do this thing because we love it. And that's the only thing that you have to do. Just love being there every day. If you don't love it, there's something going wrong. You know, there's, there's almost, you know, evidence, every great sport and achievement. I was reading a book uh, by Ryan Holiday. I don't know if you've, um, I think stillness is the key and he talks about Sean Green, the baseball player. And, you know, in a complete moment of life changing circumstance, his decision was to completely let go and just go with the flow. And he ended up having like the greatest game of all time. But I think yeah. especially for the recreational athlete that puts a lot of pressure on themselves to the point of not enjoying it, it's just reinforcing that, you know, just there is sometimes you need to hold yourself accountable, but that there's other times where you just need to let go and 
let the byproduct of enjoying it be performance. You have to be, you have to want to be better. Like you have to desire to push yourself. But if you can just enjoy the day to day work, that that's where that's where the magic is. There's a, um, you just reminded me of another story, and I do not remember the name of the athlete. He was a sprinter. I think he was like a 200 meter or 400 meter sprinter, and he would always start at the back, and right in the last hundred meters would just cruise past everyone and they started to like you know watch his approach and understand his pacing and he always raced at 85 percent he never raced at 100 percent because he had to find this perfect level of arousal where and we talk about arousal you know before you compete or before you're doing an important event um or before a workout really like any kind of any kind of you know build up towards doing something where you have to perform and he had to have arousal where he was ready to race but relaxed and being relaxed for him was the key and going at 85%, whether it was physical or psychological. And for me, it's very psychological. If I can just relax and just not have to worry about performing, I always perform better. So that whole concept of like, do it at 85%. It's hard. We know 85% is hard. Like it's not like 70% or 60%. 85% is so hard, but you don't have the pressure of like, you have to fucking go balls out. Like, full yeah. sand. You're just like, oh God, <laughs> like the it's, anticipation and anxiety of that is just ruin you. you get worked up. You feel it. You feel it in your like neck and shoulders and like everything hurts before you started. So yeah, that that was a really cool story. And that was um that was Tim Ferriss and Hugh Jackman having a chat on their podcast. And it's just like it was such a random thing for them to talk about, but it was like, yeah, that's that's that thing. Yeah, being relaxed, like not not having the pressure to perform. And I'm sure I'm sure you've had it in your sort of you know, competitive career as well, whether it's an open workout qualifier, they're like a nightmare for most people. But <laughs> nine times out of 10, most people's best open workout was the one where they were just like, yeah, I'm warm, set the clock, we'll give it a good shot. Like uh, talking about one of my friends, uh, Alex, I remember doing 17.1, there was an extra day or two days extra uh, added on to the open. And he was just like, I'll give it one more go. Like think he, think he didn't like 12 and a half minutes first run. And anyway, he put like a 10.40 up on his second effort because there was no, there was literally no uh, pressure at all. Yep. Um, yep. And that yep. just really that. reinforces it. Exactly. I'm that athlete. Like there are some people that can on a reattempt or even, you know, three times reattempt, some people will do better and some people won't. So it depends on the kind of athlete that you are. Like I know people that will never improve on a second attempt because they go all out in the first and they can just hurt and hold on. For me, the anxiety of, what's coming and not knowing it it's an inhibitor for me in terms of performing it, it i choke in that environment so choking is when you kind of actually choking or panicking there's two different they talk about failing in sport as two different things panicking is when you don't have the information and choking is when you have the information but you don't know how to deal with it so I, you probably consider it, i guess more of a panic where i don't know what's going to happen i don't know how bad it's going to hurt i don't know where i'm going to end up i don't know what the time's going to be like and you panic and that prevents you from you know getting to that point or engaging that or uh, accessing your capacity I guess so second time through on a workout when I know about how much it's going to hurt I know about how much I have to do I know how much work's involved I know where it's going to get hard that is a completely different experience for me and that relaxed factor that like hey I'm just going to go it's okay I know what's coming like I will always every time go from you know like either three rounds to like six like I'll double <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. crazy yeah fitness was always there I just couldn't access it because I just I was just so inhibited by my fear of how hard it was going to hurt it wasn't even about how hard it hurt in the workout it was just being scared of that like that is it's just such a crazy psychological you know restrictor but um yeah the second time around for me in the open is always my best performance so just to, if we can just touch on that a touch touch on that a touch more. Um, yeah. <laughs> some of obviously like guys who train in CrossFit, just generic recreational athlete, they start putting pressure on workouts. Um, what's your sort of what advice would you give to someone that is creating that much, you know, anxiety before training? Like it's nice to feel nervous. Like I've been CrossFitting now for seven years and I still get nervous as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is kind of a nice feeling, but when it becomes, like you said, debilitating to the point of, am I am struggling to get depth in my squat because my legs are that tight, I'm that nervous. How would you sort of get someone, is it a matter of just letting go and, you know, going with the flow almost? 
For me, I have to use the people around me. And this was something that I learned in the year that I was training with Swifty. We raced each other and male female racing dynamic is awesome. Female female, um, I haven't had as much success with. That just doesn't seem to be something that works as well. Um, but me, male female is, is like really fun because what happens is rather than being in your head and being worried and concerned and anxious, you kind of focus on some external factor and that's that other person. And it's the same thing when, you know, I often find for someone who's visual or likes tactile cues, when you cue them with something where they focus on something that's outside of their body, they have a lot of success. So an example might be, um, uh, what's something that I can give you as an example? So if someone has to push their knees out in a squat, I could cue them, hey, push your knees out. And that may not really trigger them to respond. They may just, they might try, but they might not get what I want them to do. If I give them a physical target, hey, hit my hand, or hey, see that corner of the room, I need your knees to point to that corner on every single rep that you do. That external focus takes their mind out of their body and, and every time it will work. Every time they have something where they don't have to internalize the movement or the position or the change, it's like you, you're looking at two different, totally different things. It's kind of mind boggling. Um, and so the same thing happens when you're competing. When you're in your head, everything's horrible. <laughs> like yeah, You just yeah. wanna get out, you gotta get out of that place. And for me, racing is the way to do that. And I know that I'm in a good place in training when I'm like, hey, let's race, let's do this. And whether, you know, regardless of whether I win or not, that on its own is a really good way for me to one have banter in the gym and just like joke and mm -hmm. chat about performance and chat about what we're going to do and how we're feeling. And if we're scared shitless or if we're talking about how we're going to kick their ass, like whatever it is, that tends to just ease ease off some of the tension and some of the like nerves. Um, and then of course, when you're racing, like in that workout, I'm not necessarily worried about how hard I'm hurting or how bad I'm hurting. I'm kind of like, where is that person? How far away from them am I? Or how far ahead of am I? So, um, and I've kind of made that transition recently as I, I just got a little bit fitter coming out of our previous quarantine and, and now we're back in quarantine. But coming mm -hmm. out of that, I, I lost a lot of fitness and then I kind of got it back. And and just the last couple of weeks, one of my buddies that I raced with, I was like, hey, let's get the whiteboard going again. Like, let's get a leaderboard. And as soon as we do that, as soon as there's points available, it's like, that's all I focus on. And it's so fun. And you go out so much harder and you hold on. And it's like the degree to which you can take on that pain and embrace it is like, you know, temp improves tenfold because it's like, you don't care how much you have to hurt to beat that motherfucker. <laughs> like, yeah. you'll do whatever it takes. <sighs> So that, that to me is something that works really well to get out of my head. And like, I think that people should do that. I think sometimes in, in order to perform and the pressure that we put ourselves on to do well, kind of makes us forget that performing is literally about beating the person next to you. And it can be as simple as like, Hey, challenge them, challenge them, give them a challenge, bet money on it. I don't care. Like tell them you're going to beat them and like just do something about it and and that will take priority in your brain rather than you thinking about how you're doing you're thinking about what they're doing um i'm trying to think of other things that i've done that's probably probably one of the best things and it's the most enjoyable and it brings that fun factor back into training and the everyday thing of like hey you just enjoy training like that's a really fun thing to do to just challenge your mates and that's one reason that for me i came to melbourne because i wanted to be surrounded by a group of really good athletes that do that all the time they push each other all the time they're always racing that's why that's so good that's why there's this there's a whole group it's un, i've never been in a gym with so many people who are so good because yeah. when one person pushes another and then they push another it lifts everybody up mm -hmm. so i used to believe when people when people especially affiliate owners are like oh we're just we're just like an everyday gym. We're, we do a lot of scaled stuff. We're not competitive. We're not like you guys. You guys are really competitive. We're not like that. I'm like, no, it's because you're not like that and you're not sitting the bar high enough. Mm -hmm. You have someone walk into our gym that's a total beginner. They will improve so much more than the person that goes into a gym where they're like, ah, we don't do that. We don't push that high. We just do it for fun. And I'm like, yeah, we're doing it for fun as well, but we love to race. We're challenging each other. That helps us get better. So we're using each other. We're using our competitors in order to help us improve and when you can figure that out as a competitor that you need people to challenge you to make you better that is when things turn around for you in training and it's it's also for like i'm sure there's people at the gym as well that to look up to these people is almost inspiration like regardless of whether you want to be at a game sort of level it's it's ace to see people moving like that 
in the skin rather than you know on a video or on tv and yeah. I think if you have the correct mindset and you don't look at that as oh I'm never going to be able to do that and get deflated by it if you you might never get that bar muscle up but if you start trying progressions and developing certain skills because that person's helped inspire you then I think that's a great environment to be around as well Exactly. And that's the identity thing. If you're like, I'm, I'm where the gym that aren't competitive, it's like, you've immediately limited yourself purely because of how you think of yourself. If you can think of yourself as like, Hey, maybe you do scale stuff, but Hey, maybe, maybe you program muscle ups or you program rep climbs because no one can do them. And that gives people an opportunity to start learning how to do it. And then you begin to see progress. Like, you know, it's like, you just gotta, you just gotta think that anything's possible. Cause it is, it really is like, you know, like we said, no one's, no one's better than anyone else. People have just been doing more longer than other people. Yeah. You know, like people have mm-hmm. just been doing the hours, like really. So in back to sort of, you know, self-care and self-awareness almost, we're all human. So on the days you're not quite feeling yourself, take time out, whether that's to journal, whether that's listen to a book, is it almost a matter of showing up and just pushing through what's your, what's your go-to? A lot of the time for me, it, it is just a matter of like, I actually feel better when I train, even if I don't feel like training, I'll, I'll train and I'll usually feel better afterwards. Sometimes that means I come in and I don't do as much. Like I'll just scale a little bit, do things a little bit lighter and just kind of adjust it accordingly. That's probably what I implement most commonly. Like if I'm just feeling a little bit beat up, I'll, I'll show up and it's kind of like the 85%. I'll show up and I'll, I'll, I'll show up, but I'll, I'll do it at a, you know, slightly less with slightly less effort or not worrying so much about pushing as hard. But, um, I guess there's two different ways or two different things that I'll experience. If I'm going through a lot um, emotionally, I tend to journal. Like journaling tends to be my way of like getting things out. So the trigger for me that I need to journal is when I have repetitive negative thoughts, whether that's about um, someone I'm in a relationship with, if that's about work and bad things happening with whatever, if that's about dealing with clients, if I'm frustrated because I'm not getting through or it's not working, I will journal. That's how I get a lot of my emotional stuff out. Um, I do a little bit of breathing and meditating, but I haven't been doing that as much lately. I'm, I tend to be a little inconsistent with that. Um, but I also probably do meditating when I'm walking. Like I walk a lot and I'll just kind of walk to the coffee shop or just get outside. And, and that kind of is my quiet time. So yeah, if it's not just adjusting training, it'll be doing a little bit of journaling if I'm feeling like my head's really busy. Um, and then beyond that, if physically I'm just like really sore, um, then I'll take a day off. Like rest days and getting more sleep are kind of like the ticket. Um, usually if I'm not feeling that good, it's probably because my sleep has been off. That tends to be the <laughs> biggest determining factor for me. Um, sleep might be off. Um, but I will occasionally like go and get like I'll do saunas and floats and I really like incorporating a lot of that recovery stuff. The, the, the harder and the more I do the recovery things and get massages and go get treatment, like the, the better I generally feel. So kind of all aspects. It's like the physical, the psychological, the emotional. Um, I kind of try and utilize a lot of those. But um yeah, I even find, you know, for self-care, like I also like to talk about self-care not being the sexy things, you know, like we're like, oh, go get a massage, go get your nails done, go and do this, go and do that. It's like, no, you know what? Sometimes self-care for me is like just getting my car cleaned and tidying my wardrobe up. Like that. Yeah. when I come home, my house is organized and my car is clean. It's like, I feel so good. I feel amazing. I'm like, <laughs> I am like a homemaking goddess. Like, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, some of those little things are really good self-care stuff. And like, for me, like I have, to, I know I have, to, I have a couple of things on my to-do list. Like I have to do my taxes, and I'm, I'm in the process of like applying for a mortgage. It's like I have those things on my to-do list, and I know that it's annoying, and I'm kind of putting it off. But I'm gonna feel so good when they're just done. So yeah. sometimes it's getting those things in align, alignment, and then, and then you're good. So yeah, it's a bit of a range, and I know I kind of went off on a few different tangents That's there, okay. but um, yeah, hopefully that kind of covers all your bases. I think a lot of people ask me around like well, if you don't feel like training, what do you do? And and first of all, my programming is structured so that I always have two days off. I can have two days to do whatever I want. So sometimes I have two full rest days. The last couple of weeks, I've been having one full rest day and one active recovery day. So in terms of like actual training and how I deal with training, I have specifically like programmed rest days. And I think for people that are just turning up at the gym on whatever days, it's really important that they don't go like two weeks without having a rest day. Like I've done that before. And as much as you feel like you don't want to take off a day or you're really enjoying it, you feel really good. 
like you always pay the price in the end. So it, like two full rest days, if not at least one and some kind of lighter day um, helps me be really consistent with training. I'm I'm also glad you touched on the, the tidy house and the clean car, because like yeah. you referred back to in we take nutrition, for example, weirdly coming back to a clean house almost it triggers good behavior elsewhere. And I think it becomes oh, yeah. so undermined, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I'm glad you, you touched on that as well as, you know, the sexy stuff, going for a massage and a float's awesome, but and getting you'll your actually nails find, done. yeah, yeah, and getting your nails done. <laughs> you'll find that you almost, you cultivate that good energy by doing the, the really, Absolutely. really small jobs. Yeah. Especially the stuff that you see. Like, you forget how much you're in your car. When I get my car cleaned, it's the nicest thing in the world. And I don't even do it myself. Imagine how rewarding it would be if you did it yourself. Yeah. Like, you know, you see your bed every day or you see your, you sit in your car every day. And how you do one thing is how you do everything, right? Yeah. Like, how you do – and that's such a big thing in CrossFit. Like, and that's why us CrossFitters – I think, you know, it brings in this special type of people because it's like if you want to challenge yourself and work hard and sweat and suffer and like just do these crazy, horrible workouts and be in this environment that's pretty scary to approach and can be really intimidating, like you start finding these people that do things a certain way. And how they do that thing is also how they do other things. Like who you are in CrossFit is who you are in life. And I think that that's, that's why we get these really cool people in, in CrossFit gyms for sure. So last question. This is the this is the money question, the wisdom question. If you could travel back in time to to the sort of the Kate entering the fitness world, maybe uh, whether it's pre uni, post uni, whichever, uh, what advice would you give, and what wisdom would you like to share if you could jump back in time? Well, of course, like everyone says, I wish that I'd started CrossFit earlier, and I wish that I committed to like training consistently earlier, <laughs> but. I mean, I wouldn't have become the kind of person that I am now without going through the ups and downs and and learning from people and, you know, having to deal with the self-doubt or hesitating or or not thinking I was a competitor and and that whole process. Like we kind of have to go through that. And I, I'm, that's, that's a super valuable thing for me. So I, I wouldn't change that, but I probably thought that I was, I was pretty smart and I wasn't, and I'm still not. Um, like I always thought I was a pretty like mature person, Um, but you know what, one thing like I wouldn't have changed is I always did what I loved. Um, and I think that that was a really big part of how I even got to where I am now. Um, so yeah, I think my perception of myself has changed and my perception of, you know, what I want out of life has changed and what's important to me. And I think I've definitely through coaching other people and through being competitive and through meeting the people that I've met, I've definitely, um, really, figured out what my values are and I'm very clear on them and I and I very purposely live by them and I've made decisions in all areas of my life based on the person that I know that I want to be and I don't know if I would have figured that out if I were around other people or living a life on a different path just because um yeah I've just had some really incredible mentors along the way and I just have learned so many valuable things from them. I mean, even like reading, I don't even know if I would have picked up reading if I was doing something different, but I had some people that just put me onto reading and like a lot of books and, and I'm like, I would have never encountered those people if I were not in CrossFit. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of things changed. I am definitely a different person, although there are some things that I've stayed very true to, to just, you know, doing what I love and, and constantly learning and trying to trying to ask for help and trying to be a student forever. And, and I hope that I don't change that. Um, although now I think I'm better at knowing that I don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is, you know, and it's accepting sometimes that we can strive to know as much as possible, but we never will know ultimately everything. Exactly, exactly. The more you know, the more you realize you have no idea. <laughs> exactly. So where can people find you if they want to get in contact? Um, I'm pretty active on the socials in terms of I'm all over Instagram all the time. CF Kate is where I live. Um, and yeah, that's like the best place. Like I get a lot of messages and I respond to all of them. Um, it's actually a bad thing. I'm on my phone probably a bit too much. <laughs> Responding to everyone else. Well, Honestly, thank you very much for for taking time out your Monday to talk. I appreciate it a lot. Yeah, great chat.